thank you for the invitation to this wonderful event. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. It will be very hard for me to follow up on such an inspiring talk, but I will try and do my best. Um, I am a physicist working as an aircraft designer. So I did do my own share of stepping out of the box already. And I will explain something about our company for which I work, which is a light aircraft manufacturer here in Slovenia, and about the actual process of aircraft design. So the aircraft will be in a state of flux just like aircraft, uh, the talk will be in a state of flux just like the aircraft design is. And there is a message, there is no clear structure to the talk, but there is a message, I hope you will catch it. The title is The Obstacles exi Only Exist Inside People's Heads, and with this I would like to begin. I will start with a very nice piece of artwork I just recently saw in Zurich when I was visiting there uh, just before this event. It is a piece by Max Ernst, uh, whose title is that the cages are always imaginary. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a three-dimensional piece of art, so it's a painting, sculpture, uh, something in between. And what you will notice is that there is a cage around the bird, but the bars of the cage in front of the bird are missing. And the bars that you see are only etched into the surface of the painting. So this is a, probably a sort of a metaphor that Sometimes we like to keep our minds closed just because we feel comfortable that way. So sometimes there are barriers, of course, to our endeavors, to our knowledge, but some of the barriers we like to set for ourselves just because it makes our worldview a bit easier. So I believe this is what this picture represents. And I would like to talk about our company and how we try to strive to step out of the usual boxes, how to uh, perform cutting edge design and how to do it. And the motto that we have is simply aim too high. So, set your goals high. You should start with goals that seem impossible. Because very often what you will realize in the end that you are capable of much more than you think what you are capable of. And even if you do not reach exactly your target goals, the journey towards aiming too high will probably lead you far higher than you ever thought was possible. Okay, if you aim too high, sometimes personally you're not quite happy with what you achieved, but if you try and look back even if you aim too high, you will realize you did something extraordinary. In fact, people did achieve extraordinary things in the past, so extraordinary that even today it's hard to believe that this was actually the truth. So, so I, I bet some of you are familiar with all the moon landing hoax websites or conspiracy theorists claiming that we never landed on the moon. This is such a feat of looking forward and trying to achieve impossible things that even today it's hard to believe that this is possible. And unfortunately, in today's world, it probably is because we are not really targeted towards such endeavors anymore, which is really sad because today it will probably be, even with all the technology that we have, harder to get to the moon than it was in the 60s. So a bit about our company. The, com the name of the company is Pipistrel, and it was established in 1987. This was already still, this was still the time of former Yugoslavia, and Pipistrello is the name, Italian name for a bat. And why, where did the name come from? Uh, the company started as a producer of very light uh, aircraft. So you can see this is a hang glider, this is an ultralight trike, as we call them. Uh, and uh, where the name ca came from, well, it was illegal to actually fly with these contraptions in those times. So the uh, airport manager decided to turn a blind eye to all these guys, enthusiasts, trying to build their own planes and fly. So he gave them time at dusk, just before the night would set in, where they could fly, and he was not there. He was not looking what was happening. Well, he knew what was happening, but just turned a blind eye to it. So the local people start, started to call them bats, of course, and that, that's where the name uh, for the company then came from. So the company started by producing ultralight strikes. But in 2010, the company grew to the point where it received at the European Business Award, awards the award for Europe's most innovative company. Here in the picture, you can see our, the founder of the company who started literally in the garage building, building those strikes and now receiving this award. This is Ivo Boscarol, the uh, general manager and founder of the company. So what do we actually produce these days? What we pride ourselves in are extreme efficiency of our designs and a lightweight construction, which are the basic uh, elements which manage to make our aircrafts really fast and really efficient. This is the first uh, composite aircraft that our company built, and it is still the most widely sold model. 
Of course, it went through many evolutions, iterations, so it looks almost like nothing, uh, like the original aircraft from which it started, but the general shape is still there, and this is still the world's most efficient aircraft in this segment, so it can do about 300 kilometers per hour, where uh, spending about 17 liters of fuel per hour, so this means that you get to about slightly more than 5 liters or 6 liters per 100 kilometers at 300 kilometers per hour, which is quite a nice achievement. Another aircraft which was an evolution of the same design using the same wing, but was turned much more into a glider. Um, so this is the Taurus aircraft. And what is important about this particular model here is that this is the first commercially available electric two-seater in the world. So this, is, this aircraft has a, an electric engine which can, with which you can take off under your own power, stow away the engine and go, hang, and go gliding. Um, and uh, it's the first commercially available aircraft you can, electric aircraft that you can buy today. And this was our last year's biggest achievement. This is the Taurus G4, which has quite a lot of in common with the previous aircraft, namely the fuselage is the same, the outboard wing is the same, but there is just two of them grafted together. And this is the world's first four-seater fully electric aircraft with a range of over 300 kilometers. And this is the aircraft that was built with the sole purpose of winning the Green Flight Challenge, but we will return later to this. Winning the Green Flight Challenge, of course, uh, was something that uh, we were very proud of. We featured on the main page of NASA for quite a while, and this was the largest um, prize given in the aviation history, so we won 1.35 million US dollars for this achievement. We didn't stand still last year, of course, uh, just this year, in April, we introduced our four-seater four -seater aircraft, first four-seater aircraft that we built, apart from that very strange contraption. Uh, namely, this is the four-seater travel aircraft Pantera. Again, a very efficient design, capable of doing over uh, 360 kilometers per hour, uh, but at the same time fitting four passengers comfortably. So this is the aircraft on which we are uh, planning our future as a company. So, there is an, a saying in the aviation community that it's quite easy to make a small fortune in, in aviation. You just start with a large fortune, so that's the way to do it. <laughs> so, aviation industry is notorious for being a really tricky business, and uh, a lot of people fa fail by the wayside. However, our company has been going on for more than 20 years, 25 years right now, and going strongly, going from strength to strength so far. It's a very tricky business, and not a lot of people make profit in it. We don't make a lot of profit ourselves either. So then the question is, why do we bother designing such birds? So why do we really try? It's hard work. There is a lot of effort going on, a lot of investment going on. So what is the reason? Why do we even bother? It's a very simple reason. It's passion. So the whole aviation field is fueled by passion. So when you get to know this community, it's not just a business, you know, aircraft producers are not just a business, especially the light aircraft segment. It's a community. So all the people within this community, after a while you get to know most of them, and what you would do is just get into discussions with these guys, talk about aerodynamics, structures, just flying adventures. So there is a lot of passion in this industry, and this is what the industry is fueled by. Of course, without earning money, you cannot continue this passion. But earning money is not the main motivation. The main motivation is just building efficient, fast aircraft to have fun in, to enjoy doing them. And this is also the reason why our company really invests most of its, pro its profits directly back into development. There is no profits being handed out to owners, really. So everything that is earned is going just back into the design of new aircraft, just because that's the fun thing to do and we all want to do it. And this is why we like to be in it. I will now go slightly more towards why, what I personally am doing. Lately, I am mostly involved in aircraft design. And I like to say that aircraft design is that branch of design where form equals function. So there, one of the design cliches is form should follow functions. This is something most people are familiar with. And this is attributed to an American architect, Louis Sullivan, uh, a modernist architect, who tried to not to do too much 
styling, not to put too much styling into his own designs, but really to emphasize the function of any design or any architecture. What is interesting in uh, the Wikipedia page, which uh, is concerned with the entry form follows function, is, is that modernist believes, perhaps, perhaps incorrectly, that airplane design did not involve any aesthetic decisions by the airplane designers. So they took airplane designs design as this as the really the most pure form of design where aesthetics is not really important and uh, this was like a guideline to modernist designers how to proceed with their own designs in other fields like architecture furniture and so on but what is an aircraft designer this is one of the most famous aircraft de designers Clarence Kelly Johnson Unfortunately, what he worked mostly on were military airplanes, so a lot of aircraft design advancements were done in the military field, but nevertheless, all of his designs are landmarks. So some of you might recognize his designs, starting from the World War II, the Lightning aircraft, then the Starfighter, the SR-71, which is still the fa world's fastest aircraft. And here he is pictured together with uh, Gary Powers, the pilot who was shot down over the United States with uh, an aircraft of his own, of, um, Johnson's design, the U-2, which you can see in the background. Of course, when Kelly Johnson studied, there was no such a thing to study as aircraft design. So most aircraft designs, and still today, most aircraft designers are engineers. As I said, I personally come from physics. Actually, I did my PhD in quantum chaos, so switch to uh, aircraft design is not something very obvious. It's not a very obvious career path, but this is true for most engineers in our company. So. Not, most, not all of them work in the field that they studied in. So stepping out of the box is something that we really, really like to do in our company. So what does air aircraft design actually comprise? So if you check it in terms of disciplines necessary to design an aircraft, there is a fair amount of them. So starting from, of course, the most obvious one, aerodynamics, which is the science of how to understand flight, movement of air, and how it pertains to flight. But then, of course, structures, you have to make the aircraft solid, sturdy, but not too heavy. So lightweight structures is what aircraft design is mostly concerned with. Propulsion systems, control systems to actually be able to handle the aircraft. What is really important is also the business aspects of aircraft design. So in the end, what we do need to do is sell the aircraft. So very often, the marketing department will interfere even in late stages of the design, for example, of the Pantera, that we simply need to fit another passenger in so you can go for a redesign. So even business, while for engineers, it's a, very, it's a nuisance, but it's a very important part of designing an aircraft. So you need experts in all of these fields. But what you need also is very good communication between these experts. So they all have to work in unison. So Kelly Johnson was known to really want to have really small teams tightly knit teams that work together in unison, that there is no hierarchy so that people exchange ideas freely, and only then when ideas are flown freely can you expect something really good to happen. But when you start a design, so these were all the knowledge points that you require for an aircraft design, but you started from the top down. So there are really three stages to aircraft design. One is sizing of the aircraft, which is really determining how big your aircraft should be to perform a certain mission. So here in the example, I'm showing our aircraft with which we won the Green Flight Challenge. So to determine what it should look like, how big the wing should be, how heavy it will be to estimate things like this. And from there on, you can go to preliminary design, where you design things such as airfoils, the basic structure of the aircraft, how the loads will be transferred through the structure. And then all the way to detailed design, where each, every nut and bolt has to be designed and placed into its proper place so that the aircraft really is... Uh, holds together. So it's really not, the boundaries are of course very fuzzy between the, these uh, stages, but it's a really um, endeavor starting from conceptual design all the way down to the nuts and bolts. So we may return to how does aircraft design these days actually pertain to industrial design. Almost everybody is an expert in car design because everybody knows what their favorite car is like and which ones they do not like. So aircraft design is very simple in that sense. It's very similar in that sense, but simple in the way that emphasis is usually on functionality. So at the bottom, you have two designs from late 60s, early 70s, uh, both from the same time, both very similar in terms of their marketing reach. On the left, there is the Mooney aircraft, which is still today considered as one of the most, uh, let's say, the fastest, most efficient aircraft in its segment. And on the right, you have a Ferrari, obviously. 
And what you see is that function is much more emphasized on the left and on the right, the car is almost overly designed in some sense, at least to my taste. Some people like it, of course. So the question is, is styling then a secondary consideration in aircraft design? Well, we tend to think it's about time that we put also some nice styling into our designs. However, what we did start was really from a purely aerodynamic shape. On the top left, you can see that it's really a hard science to determine what is an efficient aircraft shape. You, can, you do a lot of analysis. So this is a picture from a computational fluid dynamics tool, as we like to call it, where we uh, put the whole aircraft shape into the computer, calculate the airflow around it, determine whether the aircraft has the lift, drag, stability parameters that we require from it. But at the same time, the shapes we design, we strive to make them look pretty, of course. What is very nice is, of course, that usually the aerodynamics shapes themselves are pretty in their own right. So the shape of a dolphin is something that people are really familiar with, and uh, I think most of them agree that it's a pretty shape. And we try to follow some of those cues in our own design. Uh, and in the end, well, most people did like our final result. This is the Pantera, the four-seater. Uh, we nevertheless strived for aerodynamic efficiency, but the final result, I think, is um, also quite nice looking. Some of the press did call it the flying Ferrari, which was quite of a nice compliment for us. So what is then the relationship between styling, design, and all of these uh, things like engineering and research? I like to think of it in terms of a pyramid. So design is not a discipline in its own right, but it's, let's say, an assembly of different knowledges, different approaches, different ways of thinking. So we start from, in our, cell, in our case, from the engineering part, which is where I mostly come from, or the research part, where I also come from. Uh, but also the styling is important. These are the aesthetic aspects of the design. And only when all of these things work really well in unison can you achieve a really good design. And this does not pertain only to uh, aircraft, but really to design in general. What is design anyway? So product design, I'm talking about product design. It really is about improving the culture of being in some sense. So producing objects which are both useful and aesthetically pleasing, so which improve your daily quality of life. And this really, um, it is not a discipline in its own right, but it's really a combination of various types of knowledge coming together to, to create something extraordinary. And either this comes from many people or usually one single designer, but today the role of the designer is not really as being an artist, as somebody who would be the creator, but really as somebody who coordinates the efforts of all of the people into a successful vision. The artist does have, the designer does have to have a, it's his, own, his or her own vision to bring all of these knowledges together into the shape that he or she imagined. So now we are, we are really thinking about free spaces and uh, how to design the best possible thing. However, there was a very interesting project that one Italian company asked us to do. They designed their own aircraft. And when they designed it, they realized they are missing about 50% of required lift. So they came to us and asked us, can you do something about our design? But please do not change the aesthetics of the aircraft. We really like the way it looks, but just do not change the shape. So which is a really tricky thing to do, right? Because aerodynamics is all about shapes, and then you have to work on modifying the shape, but not modifying it so that it works. So it sounds a bit impossible. So this is already the design of the final configuration, which we iterated. We went through about 15 iterations before we achieved this. Uh, and in the end, we did hit the targets. This is, of course, using the computational fluid dynamics tool. So you start with the initial design. Uh, then you improve on it until the, you re reach the resi desired uh, performance increase. And now you can compare the top design is the original design we, we uh, received and the bottom is the improved design. You can see some details, of course, in, um, uh, near the wing root where the wing is the thickest. You can see that there is a bit more radius. Uh, also, the wing shape was slightly increased, but not by much, let's say 10%. Uh, Essentially, all the main surfaces were redesigned, but you do not see it in the end, So, which was really a challenge. And we were very pleased with what we did. The only problem is that the company didn't want to pursue this project any further because the economic crisis then struck and then the company 
decided not to pursue this, but nevertheless, it was a very nice learning experience. So this is something to emphasize. Of course, the boundaries exist in our heads, but sometimes the constraints do exist. This is something to take into account. What are really the constraints that bound you, and what, what are the constraints that bind, bind your own way of thinking? This is something you have to really be careful to differentiate and to, de to determine which, which ones are the ones you can really step over and which are those uh, that really exist. I mean, physics will not change, even no matter how hard you try, the basic laws of nature will not change for you, even if you wanted to. So very often it's necessary to design through you, uh, taking into account all the constraints uh, and then proceed in your own way. So constraints, of course, limit the solutions. But what is important is if you have a set of requirements, strict set of requirements, whatever your problem is, we are talking about design, whatever, what is important is that constraints may tend to keep your focus into certain directions which are, however, available to you. And sometimes this is the way to achieve the best design. If you are constrained enough, you will then start to thinking in ways which were previously not even the ways in which you would consider because you are being guided in a certain path. So sometimes to get out of the box, you have to be squeezed out of it by the walls which are getting narrower and narrower, and then you have to find your own way of escape. And the green flight challenge, the aircraft which I'm showing here, was exactly the type of thinking which we employed to achieve this. So what was the green flight challenge? So this was a competition which was uh, sponsored by NASA. So the, NASA gave the prize money of $1.35 million to the winner. And with some very strict constraints, which um, were so strict that no aircraft before the competition managed to achieve them yet. So we had to design a completely new aircraft based on the following requirements. So using le about one liter of fuel per 100 kilometers per passengers. So if you have more passengers, like we had four, passengers, you would spend four liters per 100 kilometers, or the energy equivalent of that. However, uh, you needed to do this at a velocity of more than 160 kilometers per hour, uh, which is another hard constraint. So the faster you go, the more, less, least efficient you are, less efficient you are. And also, at the same time, you have to go over 300 kilometers far. So no aircraft can achieve that. When I'm talking about uh, energy requirements, so the fuel consumption, uh, this is about talking about uh, energy equivalent. What we did was design the, an electric aircraft which would use the energetic equivalent of this fuel. And the competition was tailored towards electric aircraft simply because the conversion of electric energy is much, much more efficient than the conversion of uh, usual gasoline engine. So this competition favored electric aircraft and this we determined right from the start. But at the same time, the aircraft has, has to be able to fly very slowly, 83 kilometers per hour for landing, and be able to take off within 600 meters over a 15 meter obstacle. So a very hard set of constraints. And then you have to take these constraints into account and think in ways, let's say, not around these constraints, but within these constraints where the paths are which you could follow. So normally what we started was we produced two-seater aircraft, and we started to do concept studies, what is possible. But the problem was where to put the engine. So on our most efficient aircraft is the Taurus, which we wanted to use because, because it has a retractable undercarriage. But where do you put the motor? So this was a design study, and this is so ugly that we didn't even want to pursue it any further. And there was really no solution. One of our competitors put the uh, motor in the tail, but this brings its own set of problems. So one of our engineers came up with the following idea. Why don't we take two fuselages because the, aircraft, because the competition favors carrying more passengers anyway, we do have fuselages ready, and if we put an extra wing between the two fuselages, we get place for the motor, and this is going to all just work nicely. And at first we thought the idea was crazy. Uh, it, it makes no sense. Uh, but then the more we thought about it, the more sense it made. First of all, we could use a lot of standard parts to build this aircraft, which was important. We designed and built this aircraft in the time span of five months, so uh, time constraints were very strict as well. So we needed a simple design, although this doesn't look simple, but let me tell you, it's the simplest we could do. Uh, and um, this was really the way to go forward. Um, so uh, what you see is the aircraft is composed of two fuselages. So the, all, all the stuff that we needed to design was between the uh, two fuselages. So we designed the extra wing, the extra propeller, the nacelle. The nice thing about such a separation of fuselages is, is that you can put all the mass into the fuselages 
and this helps with uh, the weight of the structure. I will not go into the details, but this was the main important thing about this aircraft design, namely if you distribute the mass along the wingspan, this is the, in this way you can make the structure the lightest, and this was the, one, of the winning, uh, one of the keys to winning this competition, having such a light aircraft. And then aerodynamic design was my job on this project, so uh, you needed to design a flap, so then the hard science research begins. So you go into research and determine what you need to do to actually achieve the performance targets that you set out for yourself. And the special propeller design on the left, there is a map of the energy efficiency of the motor. Do not bother looking into the map. It's really important just to emphasize that there is a really lot of technical work going into the design of such components, really hard thinking, going through a lot of disciplines, not just aerodynamics for propeller design, but also thinking about uh, electrical engineering. But in the end, the result is almost like art. So the, the, this was an optimized design of a propeller, and it looks like, almost like a sculpture. We, of course, tested the wing, so we didn't let anything to chance. This is a very impressive video. So how much? So we needed to test to determine whether everything just will hold together. And it goes still further down. So this is the moment. It's very dangerous as well because if this energy gets released, this is going to fly all over the place. So this was a very nerve-wracking moment. Uh, but then in the end, the aircraft did fly. So this is one of the few videos of the aircraft in flight, actually, taking off under its own power. It's just going for the competition at this point, retracting the undercarriage, and doing the 200 miles necessary to perform the mission. So it looks huge, but from this view, the aircraft actually looks quite small. Just from one view, it looks huge, but the cross section is quite small, so that's the reason for its efficiency. And here you can see it coming in to land after the competition. One of the unique features of this aircraft is that you can land only half of it. If you try really good, you will see that once the aircraft bounces, it will keep rolling just on half of the fuselage. So this was something that annoyed our pilots, but we had very good pilots, so no problem. So touchdown, but then half of the aircraft still going airborne and then touching down. So we were very happy to win this competition. Our design was the best in the end, so we did win. Uh, you can see all of our sunburned faces here uh, throughout the competition. We were mostly in the sun, but very happy. And our achievement didn't go unnoticed. So we were the Collier Trophy nominee for 2011. The Collier Trophy is the biggest achievement in aviation, the biggest award for, uh, you can obtain in aviation. So we were very pleased with uh, being nominated for the year 2011. So above is the team that worked on the Taurus G4, and below is the team that worked on the Pantera. So some of the same, most of the same people plus a few extra engineers, and this is the future in which we are going in, the bottom design, the Pantera. So uh, how, do, how to make a team work? What is important is that you have enough specialist knowledge, clearly. You require specialist knowledge from all of the fields I mentioned. Without this, there is nothing. But you need much more than that. You need a lot of lateral communication between experts in different fields. You need to get the people together to exchange ideas. But even more importantly, perhaps in the end, you have to have critical thinking so that people do not get in love with their own ideas or other people's ideas, but to critically be able to evaluate them, to see which ideas have merit, which do not, and do it objectively. This is really, really important. But in the end, of course, they have to have passion for what they're doing. This is something I want to emphasize strongly. Without passion, we would never be able to achieve this. We would never work the long nights uh, necessary for both of these projects to make them on time. So passion is necessary. To conclude, this is, this is something I actually just saw very recently in, uh, not a, in, in a place called Dachau. Namely, I was in the museum at the concentration camp. And this was one of the one of the main ideas that's put into the first part of the exhibition, uh, this is a part from the uh, Weimar Constitution, which says that art, science, and the teaching thereof are free. The state guarantees their protection and takes part in fostering them. And this was one of the liberties that was 
in times not so much unlike the times of today with, with the economic crisis and so on, where the whole of the world went to in, into a turmoil. This was one of the liberties that was uh, quickly cancelled. And we are seeing some of this happening in the uh, way that politics likes to interfere, making the universities more efficient economically and in, uh, to interfere in the ways of teaching. And this is not a good idea. So we need people, also in engineering, we need people with strong capability for critical thinking. We, we do not need engineers that know their specific set of knowledge and be stuck in that rut. No, what we need also in engineering is people with strong critical thinking and uh, to keep universities free in the ways they teach and what they teach and what their research is, I think strongly is very important, not also for the well-being of people to understand the world, but also for us to be able to improve our quality of living. So we can either be stuck in our own boxes, <laughs> each in our own box, or just work together to fly above the clouds. So thank you. <laughs>